Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the Planning Applications Committee meeting of Thursday, the 5th of July, 2018. And I can, remind, can I remind everyone present that this meeting will be recorded and may be made available for public listening at a later date. Do we have Cedrant and apologies, Lucy, please? Good morning, everyone. We have 16 members present. We are quorate. And so far, I have received apologies from Councillor Ferguson, Councillor Lever, Councillor Murray and Councillor Tate. Councillor Fairbairn is on other business, but has indicated that he may be along later in the meeting. Thank you. Any declarations of interest? Oh, it's quite a number of members I've got. Patsy, David, Jane and Katie and Jane Maitland. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, I'd have to declare an interest in item four and five. Um, my brother-in-law is an objector, I think, in item four, and my cousin is one in item five. Thanks, Patsy. David? Good morning, Jim. Um, item six, I've had various meetings with uh, both uh, proponents and opponents here, and it's probably unfair to say that I've entered the room with a, um, without making a judgment, so I will uh, exempt myself from item six. Thank you. Thanks very much, David. Jane? Uh, number nine, I have an interest in a company that manufactured the base of the kite system. I will declare an interest and leave. Thanks, Jane. Katie? Thank you, Chair. It's just to say that I'm no of one of the objectors in item four, but my position isn't that I would need to leave the committee. Thanks, Katie. Andrew? Chair, I've got a similar... Well, actually, it's the KPS... I have got friends that work for KPS in that location, so I will actually, I'll leave the room at that point. Thanks very much. Uh, which item is that, Andrew? Agenda Pass. item number? Uh, nine. Thank you. I, I have a declaration on agenda item number eight, Brown Foods. I have met with the roads manager and the director of Brown Foods to, can, to discuss a uh, road safety in respect to the new road that's been planned and it's been discussed in Connell Community Council whilst I was present, but I've not discussed any aspect of the planning of that, therefore I intend to remain and determine the application with the rest of the members that are here. Thank you. Uh, can you go through the procedure for today, Lucy, please? The Planning Applications Committee will consider each application in turn as detailed on the agenda. The case officer or other appointed officer will make a short presentation addressing the determining issues accompanied by digital images. Any late information, amendments or corrections will be reported at this time. Members may ask questions of officers following the presentation on points of clarification. The chairman has been provided with a list of eligible representers who have registered to speak at this meeting within the period specified in Council policy. No other persons will be allowed to speak. The Chairman will be individually invite those who have registered in advance to speak to make their presentation, after which they may be questioned by committee members. No questions may be asked of members. The order of eligible parties being heard will be as follows. Third parties objecting to an application, Third parties supporting an application, statutory consultees objecting to an application, elected members of Dumfries and Galloway Council who are not members of the Planning Applications Committee, such members should withdraw from the committee chamber after making their presentation, applicants or their agents, representers have been placed in alphabetical order and a copy of the public speaking list is available from the committee officer taking notes of our proceedings. Presentations will be strictly limited to three minutes per person, excepting for national and major developments, which by their very nature are more complex, where the time limit will be five minutes. The chairman of the committee will ask you to come to a conclusion if you take too long. Representers are encouraged to use all the time allotted to clarify any points they consider material and address the determining issues. Certain matters are not normally pl material planning considerations and will not be taken into account by the Council when deciding on a planning application. 
Representors should not raise any new matters without explaining why they were not raised earlier with the case of officer. Please do not repeat what is in the report as members will have already read the report. After all the representations have been heard, the meeting is then in formal session and no members of the public may address the committee from the public gallery. The Planning Applications Committee will then proceed to determine the application or, where appropriate, agree a recommendation to be made to full council who will determine the application. Thank you, Lucy. We come to agenda item number three, minute of meeting of the 7th of June 2018 for approval. Is that a true record? of the meeting. Thank you. In that case, members, we come to agenda item number four, an application for the erection of wind farm comprising nine wind turbines, six at maximum height 130 metres to blade tip and three at maximum height 149.9 metres to blade tip. One permanent anim anemometer mast, maximum height 100 metres, control building and substation and formation of access tracks, hard standing, Temporary construction compounds and borrow pit and associated works at land encompassing Lorg, Altry Hill, Craig Stewart and Alhort, approximately 12.5 kilometres southwest of Sanker. The application types a full application, reference numbers 15 stroke P stroke 2 stroke 0337. The recommendation is to approve subject to A, the successful completion of the appropriate legal agreements in six months the date of the decision or any extended time scales are agreed by the appointed officer and B conditions. The case officer is Andrew Robinson. Andrew, would you like to take us through your presentation and slides, please? Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, just before I start, I'd just like to highlight uh, um, an error in the report in respect of condition two, uh, where we've uh, recommended that uh, the commencement of Delamber Development shall be no later than date occurring three years. Uh, that should actually read five years, which is consistent with what we recommend for uh, other wind farm proposals. It's on page, uh, condition two, on page 60. Okay, so the uh, application site is situated at the head of the Kenwater Valley. Um, it's roughly halfway between uh, Cars Fen and Sanka, and it's highlighted in red on the plan on the slide shown there. Uh, the proposal, um, which is described in paragraph 1.4 of the report, um, it encompasses the erection of uh, nine turbines in the southeastern uh, part of the site, along with the various infrastructure required for the turbines. And it also includes the formation of, a, of an access track, which runs to connect onto the log road, but it also connects into this, further into the site and into the East Ayrshire Council area as well, where it's proposed that access to construction vehicles will also utilise that uh, part of the route. Uh, the scheme has been amended throughout this application. It previously comprised the erection of 15 turbines. And just to give a bit of context, it included six turbines in this area to the northwest but that's been omitted as a result of concerns raised. Uh, the infrastructure in East Ayrshire is actually uh, restricted to just the access track and a separate planning application has been lodged with them and it's currently at a minded to approve stage. Uh, this is the uh, proposed turbine elevations. Um, it's, it's a typical three-bladed turbine varying from 130 metres in height to tip for six turbines and three turbines being 150 metres and also the erection of a, a, an anemometer mast to a maximum height of 100 metres. Uh, in order to access the proposed site, the, the access road will require the formation of uh, water crossings um, in the form of one bridge and 12 culverts. So this just shows a typical bridge design that would be constructed as part of that. Um, the proposed site um, is situated within the Ken unit, uh, Southern Uplands with Forest Landscape Character Area. So this shows the application site uh, in a 35 kilometer extent. Um, and if we zoom in to within 10 kilometres, you've got uh, the site here situated within the uh, southern uplands with forest. You've got the narrow water valley landscape character there, which is effectively where the log road runs through. 
you've got the Southern Uplands landscape character here and the Upland Glens uh, landscape character here and this is the Foothills landscape character. Uh, in terms of landscape designations, the application site uh, is not situated within a, a designated landscape area, but it is situated in fairly close proximity to the Thornhill Uplands Regional Scenic Area and the Galloway Hills Regional Scenic Area and over the border, the East Ayrshire Sensitive Landscape Character Area. Uh, in terms of theoretical visibility for the wind farm in itself, this is what is um, this is for the wind farm. So in terms of visibility for one to three turbines is highlighted in green. Uh, blue is uh, four to six turbines and the pink shaded areas are where you would see seven to nine turbines. And similar scenario, that's, that's for blade tip and this is for the hub height. And we've just zoomed in. Uh, this is to within six kilometers to show you in a bit more uh, detail of theoretical visibility in closer proximity to the site. Uh, in terms of other wind farm developments in the surrounding area, um, this slide shows where they are positioned. And in terms of the names of them all, um, I'll just quickly run through this. Um, there's the application site. You've got Windy Rig to the west, which was which is currently a mighty to approve stage. It went to committee in December. Uh, you've got the Windy Standard cluster here. Um, you've got the Longburn application, which is currently at an appeal. Uh, decision is due within the next month on that, we've been told. Uh, you've got existing Weather Hill, um, which is operational. Uh, Weather Hill Extension has is, is currently got an application in. Uh, Whiteside Hill is being constructed and very nearly operational, as well as Sanka. Uh, six as well, and Sanka wind farms. And in terms of cumulative impacts in relation to these, uh, these other schemes, um, uh, this is uh, between the existing, this is existing and consented schemes just in general. So yellow area shows, uh, which is just the proposed wind farm. Uh, in green is proposal and existing wind farms. Uh, Pink is proposal and consented wind farms, and the grey areas uh, are effectively all of the proposal, existing, and consented wind farms. And to, this is to this, the same scenario, but zoomed into within a, a 10 kilometre um, distance. Um, and this is a commutative in relation to particular schemes. So in relation to this one, we've got Logan Weather Hill, which is highlighted in green. Uh, pink is the proposal Whiteside Hill and Sanka 6. And the grey areas are proposal Weather Hill, Sanka and Sanka 6. So effectively all the ones shown on that slide. Um, the dots rel uh, show the, the um, wind farms. So that's the Sanka cluster and that's the Whiteside Hill cluster. And that's zoomed into within 10 kilometers to show you a bit more detail of that. Um, so this is the uh, application and consented ones. Um, so again, this one shows, um, shows it in respect of, uh, you've got Windy Rig and uh, Longburn, which is currently at refusal stage. And we've shown that in a bit more detail And finally, for commutative, this is uh, just the application and general commutative. So effectively, um, this will show it with, um, as I said before, Windy Rig, and that's Penclo there as well. And again, in a bit more detail. So moving on to the viewpoint, um, this is taken from the Striding Arches. We've got three from the Striding Arches because there was uh, concerns raised uh, in representations on this. So this is taken from Colt Hill Striding Arch, which is located close to the site. It's to the southeast. Um, so you've got the map shown where it is, and that's the, an existing photograph and a wire line. And if we zoom in on that, um, you can see the photo montage showing the, the wind turbines just here. And it will sit behind uh, commercial forestry. 
Um, this is taken from the Ben Brack Striden Arch, which is to the south of the site. So again, existing uh, photograph at the top and um, a wire line beneath. And that's just showing it in a bit more detail on from there. And the final striding arch is taken from Bale Hill, which is located a little bit further to the southeast. And in respect to the striding arches, this is what they are. Um, they're all very similar. There's three located on these um, um, on these peak of the hills. And effectively, what the, the one of the reasons for them is, is that you're supposed to see them as beacons in the landscape from each point. So this is from Bale Hill. So what I've tried to do here is so the extent of the application site, which is in here, and then that's the location of Ben Brack Arch. You won't see it on the photograph, but you can from the viewpoint. And you can see them as, as sitting on top of the landscape features. And the wind farm will sit uh, just there. And this is now taken uh, showing the photomontages from this viewpoint. So I'll uh, go to... It will, it will appear as more of a distant uh, feature from this viewpoint with two of the turbines um, um, visible here and the rest sort of sat behind the hills. Uh, the Southern Upland Way, um, this is actually taken from a, a forestry road. Part of the Southern Upland Way actually uses the forest road which runs from Connell it actually connects all the way down to Monii, but part of the Southern Upland Way uses this forestry road. So, uh, so this is taken from part of that route looking towards the site. Um, and that's the photo, that's on site photographs just to give you an idea of, of, of the appearance of this area. And these are the Y lines for it. And as you can see, a photo montage there. Uh, next few viewpoints are taken from the Log Bridge, which is within the narrow wooded valley character area, which is quite a sensitive landscape. Um, so from Log Bridge, which is located quite close to the site, uh, it doesn't show any visibility of the uh, proposal. And just a bit further to the site, um, on the approach to the head of the road, you will start seeing a few turbines, but they are set back behind um, the hill ridges, which is what the landscape capacity study advises in this landscape character area. And you've just seen the tips of turbines in the hub of, of, of one or two of the turbines. And this is taken at Smitten's Bridge, um, which is where you, uh, the start of the road, the main road to go up to the log road. So. The, Couple of on site photographs to show you the, the landscape here. And again, you'll see that a few of the turbines just here set behind, um, set behind the hill. And in a bit more detail. Uh, final viewpoint is from the Kensmore of Cars Fen. Um, given the height of this viewpoint, you will see all of the wind farm, but it is set back further from, um, from this viewpoint with um, effectively Windy Rig being, being the closest, uh, some of the Windy Standard cluster. And there's the proposal here, which sits sort of in the open moorland as you look down on, on that landscape. And we've put this in, this is, shows the recreational routes. There's a, there's, there's a number of core path routes, in particular the Southern Upland Way runs along the, the eastern and southern site boundary. And you've got um, core paths in purple, you've got rights of way in blue, and you've got heritage trail, the Log Heritage Trail along here as well. And as part of the planning conditions that are recommended, um, uh, it is the landscape architects recommended a, a potential to actually upgrade this access route as an alternative route as well. And this is, this is actually the site from the Southern Upland Way. So it's looking out over the, the moorland. So you've got the Southern Upland Way um, which runs along, effectively it bounds the forestry area. And this is the approach to the southern, uh, to the site from the southern upland way. There's a gap in the trees and then it goes into the, um, effectively where that access track road is that I showed you before. And it connects into that area and then off to Sanka. Um, this is where the noise monitoring locations were taken. So you've got uh, um, Polkik, Polkik was the nearest proposal and uh, properties at uh, Del Quen as well. That's where the noise assessment readers were taken from. 
and we've included a, a vis there's been included a visual residential visit a vis a visual amenity assessment in this again um, to pink are the areas where you would see potentially all of the turbines from uh, this is taken from Pulski um, so that's the wire line but that would in theory on site it, it would be screened largely by the co commercial forestry plantation in this area and another property further along I think this is from the Scar Valley Road actually um, looking towards the site you can see the wire line there Okay, so in, in conclusion on this scheme, um, it's considered that the main the significant impacts are restricted to uh, landscape and visual impacts from uh, some areas, in particular significant impacts on the section of the Southern Upland Way and some of the viewpoints from the striding arches. Um, the impacts of the Southern Upland Way are considered to be restricted to a relatively small distance and the impact from the striding arches viewpoint, whilst prominent, it's not considered sufficient to warrant refusal um, given the proposal addresses mainly the, the constraints within the uh, capacity study and also as well as part of the, there's the option of forestry restructure which is recommended in one of the conditions which can enhance the relationship of the scheme with the striding arches and the southern open way so on the whole the scheme has addressed the constraints and opportunities that's highlighted in the capacity study in respect to landscape and visual impacts and it would it's considered a form of cohesive design wind farm and it's therefore recommended for approval thank you very much andrew a member's questions for case officer ian yes uh, one quick one just uh, the, the use of the, the word permanent anemometer uh, i'm just wondering why it's a permanent anemometer because normally it's for, to collect data over a relatively short period two or three years and also the use of the word permanent when the whole scheme only has a 25 year lifespan. Andrew? Yeah, I, I take that point uh, actually, but it's permanent in so far as the scheme is in operation, um, but obviously as part of a condition, it would be required to be removed as part of decommissioning. So it, it, I, could, I could actually understand actually the word permanent thinking ahead of how we describe these is probably not, um, because it's not, supposed to be permanent after this not supposed to stay there after this a scheme would be decommissioned it would be expected that it's taken away as part of decommission with the rest of the scheme i presume we could put a condition or amend the condition ian i have by john young and then david james and jim mccomb yeah, thank you chair you said that half of the application site was in east ayrshire and a planning application was lodged i missed when you talked about it being approved, did you say it had been approved or was pending approval? Andrew? The aspect of the scheme that lies within East Ayrshire Council is the access track, is part of the access track. It went to their, um, it's about a three kilometre distance, and it went to their committee in February, and it's minded to approve subject to completion of a Section 75 agreement in respect of restoration. Thanks, John. David? Um, thank you, Chair. Um, <clears throat> on the first page, um, the application um, site is described as being in the Castle Douglas and Crockett Ford ward. Um, I don't know if my colleague John Young has used his um, administration connections to make a land grab, but um, I haven't been uh, looking at that area as part of my ward duties until now, so I think it's well out with the um, Castle Douglas and Crockett Ford ward, possibly D, but I'm not sure. I, I would suspect it, it's obviously been, been registered, the way it's been registered. I imagine that the wrong box has been put in uniform, so we can, we can amend that to put in the correct ward. Um, thank you. And just, just quickly on the presentation, I mean, we had a lot of uh, slides going past very quickly there, but I just wondered um, whether in the future it would be possible to have, um, when you show the regions from which a land uh, wind farm can be seen, um, I think you had them in different colours for different wind farms, but possibly if it was done with shading and then it overlapped, you would see areas from which you could see um, several wind farms, you know, due to the density of colour, if they were overlapped, whereas it's not really a good representation if you just colour one zone arbitrarily one colour because it's nearer to the some wind farm or another. And um, to judge the cumulative impact, it would be quite good if maybe in the documentation we could have um, 
a map of a similar scale to the one we have at the moment, but just the, the features backed out, but just the um, positions of um, wind farms e existing and, and proposed. Um, because it's quite difficult with the uh, picture quality here to, to judge that. Thanks. David, I'll get, I'll, I'll get our David to answer the last two points for Thank you. Thank you. In general, what we're actually showing are the visualizations which come in by the, the applicant's agent. We don't have the capacity or the capability to actually show that ourselves. Obviously, all these documents are online, so any member who's interested can see those online and see the, the full color details. And equally, they're available in Kirkbank to allow anybody to actually see the, the paper copies of those as well. Um, they are, it's a reasonable point about the slides which we do show. That's maybe just saying it on the slide for a few seconds, um, showing it in the context of the other wind farms. I, I'll have a think if there's a way we could actually allow members to see that um, in advance. Thanks, David. Think anything constructive that will help members to understand better what we're looking at it would be useful. Thanks, David. I've got Jim McComb, Jane, and then Katie. Thanks, Chair. At 4.35, there is reference to concerns raised by the landscape architect East Ayrshire Council and SNH. Now, do these concerns relate to this proposal or to the earlier proposal? Andrew, that paragraph is uh, it related to the um, to the pre pre the previous one and what and why it was redesigned. So it's 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 explaining as part of how this application has, has progressed to where it's got to. Um, obviously, a number of concerns were raised with, with the scheme that was, well, the, the turbines that were omitted. Um, so effectively, what it's saying is, because the consultation responses that were received were to the environmental statement, so they're still valid. Um, but then the further environment information that's submitted is for the revised scheme. So the consultation responses are there. And it effectively, it also highlights as well the, the constraints for what the scheme needs to avoid as well. So effectively, that's been listed there. Um, but it does refer to what were the concerns were raised for the pre well, for the scheme that was first submitted. Do I come back, Jim? Please, Chair. My question, Andrew, is were these bodies given the opportunity to comment on the modified scheme? Andrew? Yes, yes they were, and effectively the consultation responses in section two mainly refer to the consultation responses received in respect of the further environment information. So what I've done when I've summarized the consultation responses is really it's, it's particularly with the landscape architects consultation response, that is for the amended scheme. I've not put in because really it's, it's not relevant anymore um, to a certain extent. Um, so the comments from the landscape architect within the consultation response and SNH um, are um, in the consultation section. In respect of East Esher Council, they objected to the scheme um, previously. They then removed that objection when the revised scheme came in. So when the further environment information came in in November last year, we did a reconsultation with all consultees and members of the public as well. It was a full blown reconsultation and everything that's covered in here refers really to that. Um, we do have to cross reference back to previous comments raised at the previous consultation because for SEPA, for example, They'll just comment on further environment information on, on the changes that have happened, but then they'll say, well, our previous comments still apply, and it will be quite a long list of issues that they cover, so groundwater, terrestrial ecosystems. So we do have to sort of put the two together, if you like, when we write the consultation, summarize the consultation responses section. Thanks, Jim. You want to come back again? No, I, I accept what Andrew has said. A full, a new consultation has taken place. Thank you. Thanks, Chairman. I've got Jane and then Katie. Um, thank you, Chairman. In um, paragraph 4.91, um, the, um, the writer suggests that we have had representations objecting to road safety issues and concerns over the road network 
ability to accommodate traffic. Um, now, I see at the end of that paragraph that it's considered that the concerns of representatives can be sufficiently alleviated on road safety, but it doesn't say anything about concerns about the amenity of community users of roads up there. And I have to say that Carlsfern Community Council's agenda has been filled with angry members of the public um, concerned about the state of roads uh, for various reasons, not necessarily to do with wind farm traffic, but forestry and basically large vehicles using unsuitable sized roads and damaging them. Now, I see um, that elsewhere in the um, conditions where we minded to approve, um, there are suggestions that um, in 19 and 20 um, that conditions shall be implemented to the satisfaction of the council. But so what? I mean, how would, do we know that you're actually going to be on top of this and be able to check what needs to be done on an ongoing basis so that we are absolutely clear that this development cannot happen unless the roads network is properly protected? I'll ask Andrew to answer that, but it'll be challenging because if they're public roads, there's no restriction on what vehicles can use them, and forest routes are already agreed by a, 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 the forest route management team. But, uh, Andrew, can you a, answer Councillor Maitland, please? Yeah, I can. The, the, the issue with um, conflict with, with other vehicles has been raised by the roads officer, and what they've recommended is that the traffic management plan would actually plan the times of routes um, it's my understanding that roads have agreed routes with the Forestry Commission, for, for instance. So, I, mean, I know the B729 is, is, is quite a busy forestry route to a certain extent. Um, and I think what they're getting at is that they will agree the timings of construction delivery so that it doesn't conflict with that scenario. Because obviously, if you were to have wind farm construction at the same time as, the, as forestry vehicles moving, then there's clearly going to be a conflict there. Um, but that is, 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 is proposed to be ironed out as part of a traffic management plan to agree the timings of routes and what, and what vehicles will use the routes. And that's done in consultation with the roads officer. And they also consult the police and Transport Scotland as well, although their remit is only for the trunk road network. But the roads do consult the police. And in this case, we're also cons we would also consult East Ayrshire Council because part of the route um, is proposed through that area. They did actually raise concern um, with part of the route going through that area due to wind farm commutative impact. Um, so that's why we we put in to consult with them. But in terms of the agreement of times of route, it is quite key that that is within the traffic management plan to alleviate some of the concerns that you've stated. Thanks, Andrew. I think Jane, it's on. Recommendation three, page sixty. But we also do a pre and post inspection where wind farm constructors are concerned. The roads authority does, but remember, we're no roads authority today. You want to come back, Jane? Well, I do because you know in the recommendations are quite clearly an obligation for the developer on page sixty uh, to repair any damage to roads caused by or in connection with construction. So I mean, this is part and parcel of what we're talking about today. And I have to say. Chairman, I have to report to you that it is a great concern, as well as the beleaguered sense that Carsten has in respect of the physical uh, um, surrounding of them by wind turbines, both approved and suggested. Um, they are very angry at the moment about the state of the roads up there. And we are being told here that there will be an obligation for the developer to repair any damage but I want to know how you will know about that. And I would need to be, I need to be sure that we have in, pos in, in position, we have some means of making certain that we will get proper reparations from any development that might or might not be agreed today. Andrew, I'll get David to respond. Uh, thank you, Chair. Yes, this is covered on page 60. It's under number three of the legal agreement heads of terms. So what you're saying there is just the head of terms. It's not the actual full, the conditions are in full, but that's just to give you a flavor of what we would be looking for in terms of a legal obligation. As the chair correctly mentioned, what we normally require as part of that legal obligation is a survey to be done 
pre-commencement and a survey done post-commencement and an undertaking that the developer will undertake works to repair things that are directly attributable to them. It is not an exact science, I accept that, because you do have a public road which is being used by other people, especially on a forestry extraction route, it becomes very difficult to say it is that party and that party alone. That, for that reason, roads usually look for video surveys to clearly demonstrate things which are directly attributable. Other things on a, a more commonly used public road are less able to actually pin down to one developer. Thanks, Jane. I've got David Mc... Oh, I've got Katie. Sorry, I've got Katie, David McKean and Ian. Thank you, Chair. Um, I would just like to touch on the subject of the Southern Upland Way and access and the, the fact that the West Highland Way brings in huge amounts of economic value to the region further north and how the Southern Upland Way, there's huge efforts being brought to make that experience better. Now, looking at the paper, I see that there was the three community councils were consulted. Carsfern raised concerns but no formal objections and both Corsic and New Galloway put in objections and both specifically mentioned the Southern Upland Way and the impact of that. Now, I note that the Council Access Officer on 2.11 raised no objections, but there's no mention that the Council Access Officer, as far as I can see, is not is dealing with the actual infrastructure of our core path and such things. Now, I'm aware that the Council Access Officer does go to the Outdoor Access Forum to liaise, but I, I don't see the Outdoor Access Forum being a statutory body. And can I ask why they're not consulted? Because I do note further on, on page 47, it discusses visual impacts and, and refers to cyclists and scenic drivers and walkers and such things. And certainly the Outdoor Access Forum is a collection of a whole body of individuals with different needs that access all our areas. So it, my question really is, the access officer's role, are they purely on infrastructure rather than any recreational aspects of the access to our countryside? Andrew? I'm not really sure what the, what the wider remit is. I suppose I can only comment on the, the responses that we received back from them. They seem to be more focused on whether a proposal would impact on an access in terms of physically, you know, whether a proposal would, would um, rather than indirectly, so whether a proposal, for argument's sake, would, would, would affect or require an access, it would go over an access route or would block it or something like that. I would suspect that that's where they would, would raise an objection. I, they don't tend to comment on the sort of the re wider recreational benefits of the access routes. It tends to be mainly just as an infrastructure um, point of view. It seems to be it tends, and the responses will be tend will say that as long as the proposal will avoid direct impact on the on the right of way, or that it remains open at all times. So it's really about the operation of the access routes that they seem to be focused on in their consultation responses. Um, but in terms of wider sort of visual amenity impacts, that's covered by the landscape architect who will look at that in her response as, as part of these routes as a recreational feature and how a scheme is then affects that as a recreational feature. So the landscape architect does cover quite a lot of that. Katie. If I could just come back, it would be exceedingly helpful as the elected member that sits on that outside body for the outdoor access forum, for the landscape architect and the um, council access officer to actually liaise with our own body, so to speak, that's actually encouraging people into the countryside. So I guess that would be a request that in future could we actually build those connections on the network that we already have. Thank you. Can you ensure that complied with Andrew if possible? We can, we can definitely make a note of that, yeah. Thanks, Andrew. David McKee. Just, just following on for that, the, the 4.53 effects on the southern up upland we are limited to a small distance of less than five kilometres. What an absolute nonsense. Can I, could you, I think the last photograph you, you took a viewpoint was Cairns Moor of Kirsferden. Could you bring that back up, please?
I'll just I'll just carry on. My my point is when's enough enough? When's there too many uh, turbines in the one area? Remember, we're at questions for the case officer at the moment. Well, I will not be up to hundred to, to make that it's statement or that is, determination. Okay, uh, fair enough. Who does that? That's my that's my problem. You get a landscape architect. You get various uh, people in different jobs, supposedly look, looking after the area, and they're all saying, "Oh, it's fine." When when is enough enough? And when members of this committee decide it's fine. That place there. Remember the joke, we're still in question, Jack. You can have your say when we're in session, and okay. I'd, be, sorry, I'd encourage sorry. you to do that. But if it's a question for the case officer at the moment, if no, I'd ask you to repeat that in session. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Jock. I've got to Ian Carruthers and then Jim McComb. Thanks, Chair. Uh, my mother always said if you could learn from other people's mistakes, it's a wiser person if you can do that. And just take, going back to the point that Councillor Maitland, Ma um, Maitland brought up, and it's referred to, I think David said, in page 60, and it's the third point under recommendation five of the decisions. I think it's a very valid point, and go back to experience with Ferdinand mm -hmm. Dale and Estelle. It might be slightly different, but I think we need to consider it. Uh, we've had numerous wind farms in that area, and as part of the grid connection, it may not be the case, it's been underground rather than overhead, and they've accessed the public road, and some of the roads in our area, because of lack of supervision in particular, I think probably from the council's perspective, uh, I think we've had a, a better level of supervision through, from our roads officials, rather than it being left with the company or organisation themselves, we would be far better road, road, roads conditions. So I just wondered from that, reading that condition, David, I just wondered, is it strong enough if that was the case? So if they do have to access the public road, uh, and the, 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 it's the oversight I'm looking at in particular, the survey work and the oversight from the council's perspective, I mean, that could have well be, should, should we insist that actually they, they should, uh, should be a financial contribution to allow us to, to actually employ somebody or, uh, or whoever, in whichever way this is going to work. I think for this one and probably for, for mostly for, for others that come forward, it's something we should seriously look at. It's been brought up before that condition just being strengthened and, and beefed up to take into consideration that Council uh, Maitland brought up. David, do you want to deal with that? B because you, we can discuss that again in session if we're minded to, to agree, yeah. Ian, but I'll ask David just to respond to you then now. Sorry, can I just clarify that? Was that point three on page 60 in the... Yeah. Well, as I just mentioned to Councillor Maitland, what you're saying there is just ahead of terms. It's a loose description of what we'll be covering, but the, there would be a full legal agreement giving the greater detail of exactly what was required by whom, when, and, and indeed if uh, any financial um, payment would be required for that, because that's why we've said legal agreements to leave it open to use of potentially even parts of the Road Scotland Act, um, Section 69 Local Government Act, Section 75 of the Planning Act. There's various means you can use. Um, I've taken on board the comments that members have made about the need to ensure that is done. So. As part of our, any process, I'm sure Andrew would liaise with legal services to ensure that would be covered. Uh, Chair, would, uh, would it be appropriate to allow Andrew to answer Yes, that? absolutely, Andrew. I'm just wondering on this issue, Chair, whether it would be, um, we do have ongoing at the minute, um, and there are legal agreements that have been approved with this. I just wonder whether it would be um, a good idea to maybe send a template of, the, of, a, of a legal agreement to members and forward it around so that they can actually see the detail of what this does encompass because it is actually tied as part of a legal agreement. This It's not suggested as a condition. It is a legal agreement which is then tied to the land and registered on the land for the obligation for this to do this. And it's actually drafted um, by legal solicitors as part of the Section 75 agreement. And that's just a suggestion that if that would help with this debate. I think that would be helpful. I think we need to be, we're in danger of creating a position here where we'll need to have a recess to, to consider that if that's been part of this particular application. If it's general information that members would be happy to have, then that's something I think we, we, we would welcome. Ian, if it's the same point, because same, absolutely the speakers. same point. General information, I think, is, is the, the, the right direction. But to put it into context, one of the roads, when they access the, in the east of the region, that is, the access to put infrastructure in to get to the, the interconnector. Probably five, six years ago, the road's still sinking. It's still failing yet because of the lack of supervision. If we've been a proper level of supervision, there's almost lorries and tractors being lost in some of these, uh, the, the, the motorway subsidence. So it's cost the council thousands and thousands and thousands of pounds, lots of complaints. So 
It'd be a simple thing. I've a good idea if we see that general in information, and it was just about oversight and supervision of that work to the council. We're so busy doing a normal job, they couldn't overlook and supervise. And it's about getting that clause in there. So, and if and if the developer has to pay for us to employ somebody, to have that level of supervision. I think that's appropriate under the, the the particular circumstances. So it's not just for this one. Depending on the outcome of it, it's for others as well. I think so. It'd be good to see that general uh, template. Good, Ian. I've got. Jim McComb and then Dugan hopefully we can then move on to, to let the registered speaker. Jim McComb. Thanks, Chair. A number of members have referred to the importance of the Southern Upland Way. Now, we've had numerous planning applications which uh, are either astride the Southern Upland Way or beside it. But never have I seen any information on the economic importance of the Southern Upland Way? Is it possible for such information to be provided? It'll not be something that we'll do as part of our service. David? The only thing I would mention is as part of the environmental statement, the applicants will have looked at uh, socioeconomic benefit, and clearly that is one part of it, is the tourism and the potential effect on it, and they will have commented in that. Uh, it's a fairly standard thing that's a heading for an environmental statement. Is it the same point, Archie? Yeah, the same way as to give the information. Obviously, the access officer does a, 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 a load of work with economic development on what the outdoor facilities actually in Dumfries and Galloway and Southern Upland Ways are an important part of that. The information may already be there from the access officer or economic development. That's helpful. Dougie. Thank you, Chair. Um, a couple of questions for Andrew, if, if I may. Um, first one relates to paragraph 4.52 and reference to the striding arches. Now, there clearly is concern, um, as uh, articulated by objectors, in relation to the impact on the views of the, the striding arches. And I note uh, in this paragraph that the landscape architect has recommended forest restructure as a mitigation measure. Um, and the developers agreed that they would investigate this as part of a, a condition. I, I may have missed it, Andrew, but uh, in terms of a condition, how, how do we actually carry that forward if we, if we are minded to uh, approve the application? And I'm also um, concerned that, you know, if, if this isn't done properly, it could actually make it worse. Um, so it would be important to have a, a well-crafted condition in that regard put in place to make sure that the developer does, in fact, fulfil that obligation. And the other question, just a point of clarification, um, paragraph 7 um, on page 61, in relation to reference that um, if the wind turbines fail to produce electricity supply to the grid for a continuous period of 12 months, um, the wind turbine, uh, basically, there the would be a breach um, of planning permission. How, how is that actually monitored? What is the process for that? If you could just clarify that for me, please. Andrew, two points. Okay. Yeah. In relation to the first question, um, um, it's condition 45 is the full wording um, for the mitigation measures. Um, um, the applicant's agent did respond in March um, on the mitigation measures um, that was suggested by the landscape architect and agree and agreed um, a way forward for doing that. So in terms of alternative Southern Upland Way route, it wouldn't alter the route, it would be an alternative route uh, as part of an improvement. In, in respect to forestry restructure, it would be done in consultation with the landscape architect who, who specializes in sort of design, particularly in sort of forestry design and, and can liaise with, with Forestry Commission as well in terms of um, of that. So it's really a professional judgment that will be taken by the landscape architect on the submission of information in respect of that condition, um, which is required before any development starts. So we would we would we would be expecting to see a scheme that takes into in that into account. There is quite a lot of poor forestry design in that area, and there is there is improvements that can be made. Um, so that's what could, that condition would seek. Could, could, can I just come in before you mm -hmm. move on to the next question, mm -hmm. Chair, if that's okay? Would there be any community consultation around that? Um, or is this something that solely would be between the landscape architect and the developer? It, it, it's something that would solely be done with, in consultation with the landscape architect. 
as that's what's recommended. And, no, uh, condition please, please, seven please. is is a standard um, condition that we attach to all wind farm proposals. Um, it, it it has to be there if that scenario arises. And I suppose really what we what we rely on to a certain extent on this is is if we're in the area and we can see that turbines haven't been working, or generally members of the public will will go and say that this wind farm isn't working, and then we've we've taken we've got in contact with the developers from there. So we would we do require a bit of a steer in certain extent from members of the public or if, if officers are in the area and note that this isn't working. But it is it is a catch there to effectively avoid a situation where if a wind farm doesn't work and then it just sits there for the rest of its 25 year lifespan. So it does need to be there, but we would, I'll be honest, we would require um, a bit of a steer. Thanks, Dougie. If there are no other questions for case officers, we'll come to the registered speakers for today. We have quite a number of registered speakers, so I would appeal to the speakers to stick strictly or adhere strictly to the allotted time, and that's both applicants and, and objectors. So we come to the first AA speaker today, Mr William Crawford. Because this is a major application, William will be allocated five minutes, as will the, the, the applicant. So William, we have five minutes. I will speak. I will. I will remind you with thirty seconds to go, just to bring your presentation to a conclusion. And whenever you're ready, thanks, William. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Um, uh, I commend to, to you, Mr. Chairman and members, Mr. Kelly's report, which I commissioned uh, about this, and which contains various objections. And you will see in his revised report the view that the revision does not uh, meet the difficulties that he set out in the first report. He is of the view that the application remains contrary to the local development uh, plan. The reduction of turbines in the revised plan, he says, leaves a situation which is still objectionable and indeed to those of us who know that, Glenn, we think that uh, nine turbines in it will indeed uh, 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 be as objectionable uh, as he says, indeed more so. But I would like, if I could, in addition to what he has said, emphasize the importance of the Southern Upland Way in this application uh, uh, and in support of the gentleman councillor who referred to it, the uh, proposed turbines will be very visible to users of the Southern Upland Way. The uh, paragraphs in 522 identified a series of adverse effects of visibility of the turbines, and the revised scheme uh, continues with exactly the same objections as the original scheme. And um, indeed, the conclusion was, I think of 5T2, the extension of development into an undeveloped area with directed views would be a serious but not a significant effect. And it's surprising that in those circumstances, the original uh, view of the planning officers to refuse this application was not continued. I would urge the committee to consider that the importance of the um, Southern Upland Way in overall terms for this part of the world, there are many overseas visitors who don't appear at community councils but who do come to walk on uh, various walks and ways, and they will, I know, be appalled by a further uh, development in view of the Southern Upland Way, which, in their view, already has far too many wind farms visible from it. Um, the walks um, that are obviously good for them and good for the local economy, 
um, will be spoilt if this uh, application is allowed. And looking at the number of wind farms that are surrounding the southern upland way, I would respectfully submit that the words of the councillor that when was enough, enough, are apt here, and that the um, importance of the Southern Upland Way in terms of both tourist income and of the general benefits of such a scheme should figure very high in the consideration of councillors. I would respectfully ask the council uh, to uh, reject this scheme and one of the strongest objections I respectfully submit is the closeness of the Southern Upland Way to this application. Thank you very much, William. Can you just wait one moment, please, and in case any of the members have a question for you. Any members have any questions for Mr. Crawford? In that case, William, if you'd like to retake your seat, thank you very much. Thank, thank you for the presentation. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. We now have a Haley Meadley, who is the applicant. Haley, Haley present. Again, Haley, you will have five minutes in total to make a presentation, and if you'd kindly remain after that in case members have questions for you. And I'll remind you with 30 seconds to go, you should draw your presentation to a conclusion. And again, Haley, whenever you're ready. Okay. Yeah. <clears throat> Apologies for my dodgy voice. Um, hopefully you can understand me. Pull the microphone just a little shade further toward you, please. Can, can you hear me? A little bit. Sorry, sorry. I have got a bit of a dodgy voice. Um, thank you for giving me the opportunity to address you today. The application in front of you was originally submitted in December 2015 and consisted of 15 turbines. It was locate, it's located on land which straddles Dumfries and Galloway and East Ayrshire Council, so right at the top of Dumfries and Galloway. It was submitted alongside an application for an access road to the wind farm within East Ayrshire Council. <coughs> Following the submission of the original application and further consultation, the project was redesigned and a number of the turbines have now been deleted. This has resulted in a reduced scheme, which is now nine turbines. East Asia Council have approved the access element of the project and today we are seeking approval for the amended scheme of nine turbines and associated infrastructure within Dumfries and Galloway. I'd like to touch on some of the key issues that were raised during the consultation period and what we have undertaken to address these points. In terms of landscape and visual, um, these were obviously one of the main concerns raised regarding the original application. The previous design comprised of two clusters of turbines east and west within the development site boundary. Mitigation of potential landscape <coughs> and visual effects have been achieved by the deletion of the western cluster of six turbines. So the proposed development will now be viewed as one rather than two clusters. The separation distances between the remaining turbines have also increased to reduce the effects on the wash of Ken Valley and to create a simple and cohesive layout when viewed from the Southern Upland Way and the striding arches. There is no objection from the Council's Landscape Architect or s and on the revised scheme. In terms of traffic and transport, East Ocean Council have approved the application for the access track to reach the log site. This will enable the delivery of all turbine components and accommodate some of the construction traffic. There will be no abnormal load movements on roads within Dumfries and Galloway. The rest of the construction traffic is proposed to be routed through Dumfries and Galloway, um, but Dumfries and Galloway's road traffic officer has said that the road network can accommodate the projected volumes 
and that the traffic numbers are acceptable. There is no objection from Transport Scotland and no objection from the Council's Road Traffic Officer. We have also agreed to a legal agreement set out in the Planning Officer's report. In terms of ecology, we have undertaken detailed surveys as part of the original application and they have been updated for the revised scheme, which includes protected species such as badger, otter, water vole, bats, birds and fisheries. Scottish Natural Heritage and RSPB have both stated there is unlikely to be any significant impact or no long-term impact to species. Therefore, they do not object. There is no objection from the District Salmon Fisheries Board and no objection from CEPA. The SNH have requested a breeding bird protection plan and habitat enhancement measures to protect black grouse, which we have agreed to, and we will also appoint an ecological clerk of works to oversee matters. In terms of aviation, there are no objections from the MOD, Glasgow Presbyterian Airport, or NATS. Um, in terms of community consultation, throughout the development of LORG since about 2012, we have held numerous public consultation events. You have 30 seconds to go, Hayley. Okay. Um, all the comments that have been received have been taken on board. The project will supply around 21,000 homes in Dumfries and Galloway and contribute to our Scot Scottish Government targets. We are a responsible developer. We will work hard with the community to address any outstanding concerns. There will be community benefit funds in line with Scottish Government policy. Um, I am really grateful for the opportunity to speak today and I will welcome any applications you have. Sorry, any questions you have on the application? Thank Thanks you. very much, Shelley. Thanks for your presentation. Thanks. Members, I've got Archie and Katie. C can you just clarify the point where you said no traffic will be coming through Dumfries and Galloway roads on, on, on the actual installations yes. of the site? But there may be some other traffic yeah. that's used in Dumfries and Galloway roads. Yeah. Obviously, that will be part of a legal agreement. And, and would you... Would you agree that some of the concerns that were raised by members and objectors of the conditions of the road prior to and then after you as a, as a company would be uh, agreeable to that, 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 that legal agreement being yes. in place? Yeah, so just in terms of the first point, there's be, there will be no abnormal loads. So they are the large turbine components going through Dumfries and Galloway. They're all coming through East Asia Council. And that has been approved by East Ayrshire Council. In terms of the concerns of local residents within Dumfries and Galloway, to do with the rest of the construction traffic, there will be a construction traffic mitigation plan, and that's one of the conditions of the application. Um, and that traffic plan will be in consultation with the local communities and interested parties. So we will go, we will set up a community liaison group, especially focusing on the traffic management plan. And we will go through all their concerns because it was quite a big concern for East Asia Council as well. Um, so we'll go through all their concerns and we'll take all their concerns on board and feed it in to the traffic management plan. So things like the timing of construction traffic to ensure that it doesn't create any stacking effects with other operations in the area such as timber haulage um, so it doesn't conflict with schools to ensure that the you know there's a robust speed limit in place that is adhered to and how we can effectively manage that so uh, um, for example we can put trackers on vehicles things like that so all that will be taken into consideration at full consultation with the communities that will be affected. Thanks, Archie. Katie? Thank you, Chair. Um, just in your last sentence there, you mentioned community consultation yes. and you mentioned it in your in your speech prior to questions. I'm just I'm looking at the papers in front of me and in terms of Carsberry Community Council, they have raised concerns um, about the publication of the public exhibition and their claim is that nobody in the community, including the community council, was actually notified 
of any public consultation. So I was just wondering if you would dispute that or, or how, how are you working with the communities? And also they have raised that they have concerns regarding the size and the quantity of pylons. And how, how are you as an applicant working with the community to address those concerns raised by the Community Council? Well, for, for the log project, we have had a community liaison group which was set up in 2012. Um, so I've got here in front of me a whole list of what we've done. So we met with uh, Carsburn back in the, on the 14th of May 2013 in New Cumnock. Uh, we had public exhibitions at Callahan, Carsburn, and Dalmelton uh, in October 2013. In February 2015, again, we had a CLG in log, so I have a whole list of exactly what we've done. Normally for a CLG, a community liaison group, we, um, we advertise um, and we contact all the people within the community liaison group and we will let them know when the next meeting is and we will discuss at the previous meeting when it is appropriate to have another meeting. So uh, I'm not entirely sure what happened in, in that respect, but we have had a number of consultations with the communities surrounding the scheme. I, I guess I would say you can have a consultation, but unless you tell people the consultation's happening, the community would then, you know, the, yeah. it's well, whether that oh, yeah, actual yeah. notification has yeah. been given. But yeah. do you have any... Any um, response in regards to how the community concerns regarding the pylons, the size and quantity, and how the scheme can be mitigated, how that can be mitigated? So, so the, the pylons will be part of a separate application uh, for the uh, electricity, um, the connection to the grid. Um, so again, that will have to be consulted upon and will be part of the community liaison group discussions. Thanks, Katie. I've got Jane, David, and Ian. Thank you. I'm sorry about your voice. It's obviously difficult, know, so, difficult, so for, you. <laughs> difficult for you. Um, however, um, I noticed um, in the um, literature that we were sent um, that the RSPB were concerned about the carbon calculator methodology. What did you do about that? Because there's quite a lot of concern about deep peat um, the sighting of these turbines near deep peat in or on. I'd like to know how many of these turbines are actually situated on or very close to deep peat. Uh, and I'd also like you to comment, please, upon what RSPB said about your carbon calculator, which they can, were concerned about. Right, OK. Um, can I refer to my technical expert, Gareth, who uh, is the consultant, the environmental consultant for the scheme? So, Gareth. Yeah, so um, there were there were two phases of, of peat survey. There's um, a phase one, which is on a 100 meter grid, and that's used to inform the initial design work. And then once um, various factors have been taken into account, wind yield, all environmental factors, is what's called a phase two survey. And that's done um, on the likely locations of the uh, surveys on a, on a 10 meter grid, and that's used to microsite the turbines um, before the design is, is finalised. Um, so by going through that process, we're able to avoid deep peat for the majority of the turbines. I'm, I'm sorry, I don't have the exact figures in my head as to which ones are on deep peat, but um, we, have, we, we have mitigated it as, as far as possible. And the amount of peat that uh, has, is being extracted is, is uh, relatively low compared to our uh, wind farms, which are in, a, in this upwind location. Um, in terms of the carbon calculator, uh, we use the, the Scottish Government's um, spreadsheet, which is um, referred to as NAVAC at al, and that's the, that's the sort of industry standard. That's what the Scottish Government tell people to use. Um, and you, you feed in all your factors, so the um, the generation capacity of the turbines, the amount of peat that's extracted from various parts of the um, scheme, the vegetation that's removed, and that tell, gives you your carbon payback figures uh, on 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 a range. So 
Um, I, I think from memory, the, the payback figure is between 0.2 of a year in the very best scenario and about three years in, in the worst scenario, which is, which is quite good for a, for a wind farm of this size. Um, the RSPB didn't, didn't provide any specific information as to what they weren't happy with. They just, I, I think they were more in terms of habitats rather than the sort of specifics of the scheme. But what I can say is that all the other consultees, uh, CEPA are, are the main government's consultee on Pete and they were, they, they didn't raise any objection. Thank you. No, but they did raise concerns and they're particularly anxious about your peat management plan, um, about how, how it will comply and be suitable for the numbers of turbines that are on here. They, they did raise that. I think you'll agree. They did. Um, although it has to be said that the, the Scottish Government do have their own specific peat consultee and they were they didn't raise any concerns with the peat management plan or the, the peat side risk assessment. So um, I think RSPB's concern was more in, in a general peat being extracted rather than the sort of specifics of, of this particular scheme. Um, it's also worth mentioning that uh, before the scheme is constructed, there'll be a, a more detailed um, ground investigation and um, there's an allowance of up to 50 metres microsighting for each turbine. So um, there's, there's been a commitment to um, microsite the turbines to, to further um, reduce the amount of peat that's extracted um, post sort of pre-construction. Pre there is also, as part of the conditions, um, and we would do it anyway, a construction and environmental management plan that will have to be put together in consultation with the council and CEPA and FH. So they, they will be able to review what we are doing in terms of peat removal. Thanks, Jane. Th thank you, Chairman. It, it, is, it is that, that thoughts are beginning to change on peat. Um, I, I went to an extremely interesting presentation on this whole issue um, very recently, where there was a suggestion that, in fact, there was going to be um, a, a change in thinking with respect to carbon um, capture and carbon um, thoughts over the use of these places for placements of um, uh, turbines, but I'm sure that's probably in the future. Yeah, and uh, I think if if the application does um, become approved, then the construction of the wind farm is not likely to happen for another couple of years, so maybe the views may change by then and that can be taken on board with the uh, construction environmental management plan. Thank you Thank for that, you. Chairman. Thank, Thank you. you, Jane. David. Thank you, Chair. You'll probably guide me as to whether this is uh, something we can consider, but um, the applicant didn't bring it up, was um, community benefit uh, funding. Uh, I was in a recent discussion um, with another wind farm, and I was quite disappointed about the range of things that they could support with the quite a large amount of money that they was coming from this. Um, it's been mentioned that the um, economic damage uh, that may be done to the um, our, our area by effects from this uh, wind farm on the um, Southern Upland Way, and um, the, the project will be a heavy user of our infrastructure, especially in its um, construction. So um, given that there are Scottish guidelines for community benefit funding, um, can you elaborate on, well, how that funding will well, who it'll go to, and um, no. what, if any, mitigating... No, it's no. no for this committee, David, no. Uh, it's no for consideration today. That You can ask them what they might want to invest in some infrastructure, but no in relation to community benefit. Yeah, because we were told at the start of the meeting that um, we weren't supposed to go over things which are already in the port, and about 90% of the evidence presented by the lady was already in the report. So the new items um, were things like community benefit funding. So you're more yeah. experienced. So they, they can actually say, yeah, and then we can't. Right, thank you. Ian. I think I'll pick up at the next stage, Chairman. Thanks. Thanks, Ian. Jim. Thanks, Chair. You mentioned a number of community consultation events. Were these events in connection with the current proposal or with the original proposal? So, so the 
current proposal was submitted, I think it was in 2017, um, and the previous consultation events that we had were on the original scheme, so that dates back to 2012. Um, in 2017, we did contact a number of the community uh, community groups. We wrote to them to advise them of the changes in the scheme um, so they could have an opportunity to comment. Um, and then should this, be, should this application be approved in September, we will be looking to reinstate the community liaison group with the community surrounding the wind farm. So, uh, Casper, Newcomnick, Sanka, Kellum. Are you saying that there have been no consultation events in connection with the current proposal? We, in 2016, we did have a Meet the Developer event in Carsburn. So I imagine a lot of the discussions were held about the changes in the application then. Um, and on the 12th of November 2017, we uh, distributed um, a newsletter update to the communities to advise them of the changes of the scheme. I think um, because the scheme was significantly re revised, and six of the turbines had been deleted. I think it was felt that the scheme had improved. So we didn't have a committee liaison group meeting on the revised proposal, but we did advise everybody of the changes of the scheme. Thanks, Jim. If there are no other questions for the applicant and agent, I'd be grateful if you just retake your seats, please. Thank you for your presentation today. We're now in session. I've got David McKee first. He wanted to talk about a, the capacity, landscape capacity, I think, and then Ian wanted to come in. Hi. You get, you get these applications every now and again, and when you see that picture up there, I mean, it's, there's virtually nothing else but turbines there. Now, how or who makes a decision as to when enough is enough? They keep, they keep coming out with these statements. There's no, no effect on the landscape and all this sort of jazz. Now, if that's no effect on the landscape, what is? And it's all right, they're talking about there's only nine, there's only uh, uh, nine turbines going up, and it's only affecting a small part of the Southern Upland Way. But if we walk through the Southern Upland Way from one end to the other, it'd be interested to see how many turbines he walked through. So it's just a case of, can he give us a bit of guidance? as to what's acceptable and what's not acceptable. One of the reasons the application comes before us, David, is for us to determine whether or not it's acceptable, uh, and that's unfortunately the duty we've got to discharge. We use officers to give professional advice, and we decide. And if uh, we decide against officer recommendation, then it may be the Scottish Government that ultimately decides. But David, can you help uh, Mr. Councillor McKee? Thank you, Chair. Uh, yes, it's... Uh... A very standard question of Councillor McKee, and I'm afraid I'm going to give the very standard answer, which is that each application has to be considered on its own merits in the context of local and national planning policy, on its own specific impact on landscape character, visual amenity, cumulative impact, and any other material considerations. We cannot have a simple embargo against accepting new applications for wind farms. It's open to the Council, as the Chair just said, really for you to give different weight to the issues which have been raised in the report and come to a different conclusion. And in instances where it is refused, uh, either through officer recommendation and or committee decision, then it, uh, there's a right of appeal to the Scottish Ministers. So ultimately, if it's refused, they're the arbiters on that. But we have to adhere to both local and national planning policy on this matter, I'm afraid. Thanks, Joe. Ian? I think we've got a decreasing Galloway wind farm landscape capacity study as well. I think that's quite handy to have a look at when you're looking at this kind of stuff. I suppose mine was just more about the question. I, I don't know what happened about too much. It's about how the used to make sure that, depending on the outcome of this uh, this decision today, but if the if a, if it does go forward and gets an approval, then it's the, the reassurance in regards to concerns raised about roads. We spoke about a traffic management plan, but it's it's maybe if there was to be, it sounds like it's overhead rather than underground. So it's 
Uh, but it's just, I just like the reassurance, Chairman. If we get to that stage to get the chance that actually we'll make sure that that level of supervision is carried out by the council, the council, and uh, if it's needed, that is, and it's uh, it's made sure that it's conditioned such a way that there's no uh, financial detriment to the council either. The developer must must catch up on that. If we get to that stage and if we're minded to approve, then I we can try and deal with conditions because what we can't do is place requirements and stuff that they can't just comply. We have got to. Uh, uh, Archie, Jane Maitland and Katie. Thanks, thanks very much, Chair. And, and, and being a guy that's actually walked the Southern Upland Way between Port Patrick and, and Beatick, you know, there's a lot of things on, on that, that route that I wouldn't, wouldn't like to see. One of the biggest problems I find, of course, is the timber routes ourselves. Um, you get a seared neck looking down all the time when you're walking along that road, and you just get you trip over the big boulders that are part of that timber route, not the wind farms. There is a wind farm at Beatick. Uh, Far end uh, before you get to before you get to Moffat, which is on the side, you can actually gone through part of the, the thing. Um, and I think beauty is in the eye of the, eye of the beholder. In, in, in some cases, I don't like them standing stains. That's because I don't like them. Doesn't mean seen anybody else doesn't like them. So I don't like them. There, there's, there's, there's one of the issues here is of course that we have a responsibility as a as a planning applications committee to make the, to determine this application on planning terms. Uh, and, and, and when you build a house, for instance, you don't get a view as, as a, a planning, con, you know, as a planning concern. The issue for me here is that when you look at what's been done, the work that's been carried out by the officers, I think it, it'd be reasonable to say that we go with the recommendations on this one, Chair. And is that a proposal from you? I'm happy for it to be a proposal, Chair. Okay, I've got Katie and, uh, oh, Jane, sorry, and then Katie. Um, yes, I, I think, you know, I, I looked through this report in the hopes that I could find a hook upon which I could hang a refusal, but at the moment I can't find it. Um, I am annoyed, as usual, um, being shown a, a, a really uh, an unacceptable uh, proposal and then having this matched up against it. It should always be simply considered whether it is objectively suitable on its own and stand on its own. It shouldn't be compared with something that has been taken out previously and removed. So I'm, I remain constantly annoyed at the fact that I'm expected to, uh, to measure it up against something that has been decided as being unsuitable to start with. You have to look at it whether it's suitable in its own right. Um, 